In southern Oregon, the two main salmon species are the Chinook salmon and the coho salmon, seen here swimming, also known as silvers. They make their spawning runs up the Rogue River and its tributaries as far up as Lost Creek Dam. Due to improvements in water quality, they now spawn in Bear Creek, which runs through the largest human population centers of the Rogue River Valley. Coho salmon are on the endangered species list. Both have been found on Lazy Creek, a Bear Creek tributary. Neither were here until a pile of concrete debris was removed from the creek. Look at that, that's a huge amount. What if they lost all the fish, like pull some rocks there and just like leave all the big fish here? Did you understand, Jose, that before they removed all that stuff that was in the way, they didn't have this many fish up here? They didn't? Because mm -mm. they were getting stopped by that, basically a dam of, of material. In 2010, these Chinook par fry were found on Lazy Creek. Chuck Fudwich of Oregon Fish and Wildlife explains how surprising this discovery was. We captured just Chinook salmon this, this time. We caught about seven fish in a trap that was set overnight on Lazy Creek. And in the past, we've gotten warm water fish, pumpkin seeds, um, red side shiners, and sculpins, uh, and a few coho. But no coho this year and none of the other species I've just mentioned. So it's kind of neat because Chinook are normally a big river fish. And it's, it's quite extraordinary seeing them utilizing a small stream like this. And what the reason we think that is is because the small stream is about two to three degrees warmer than the main stem. And that allows for more food growth so they come in to take advantage of that. And when they get a certain length, about maybe 120 millimeters, they head back out into the larger stream and continue with their downstream rearing migration, which brings them to the mouth of the Rogue River sometime between mid-August and mid-September. And then they go out in the ocean, they spend up to seven years in the ocean. Most of them come back at age three and age four and they spawn and they die and the young uh, start to cycle all over again each year. Even the dying of the fish is a present to those who are about to come because the whole ecosystem benefits from uh, the nutrients in the dead salmon carcasses. Here's an example of salmon pairing up to spawn. The gravel bed will become a nest for the eggs. It's called a red. This is where their offspring will begin their life. It's also where they'll end it, if they survive long enough, to return here to spawn, like these sockeye salmon further north in the Pacific Northwest. When salmon return from the ocean, they stop eating, and their bodies change color. All their energy is used to return and to spawn. Sockeye are also known as pink salmon, as Oregon Chinook and Coho, sockeye make their epic run up the river to spawn. In Alaska, some of these runs are almost as great as those of legend. In one pristine area, some people want to put a massive gold mine in the watershed. They've been stopped so far due to pressure from Alaskan residents near the proposed gold pebble mine, but some are still determined to do so. The wreckage it would cause the watershed and the salmon is easy to predict. Not all salmon make it to their spawning stream. At every stage of their life cycle, salmon feed other animals. On their seasonal runs to spawn, marine mammals as well as bears gather at streams to get their share. These brown bears are moving toward a stream used by salmon for their spawning migration. The bears catch fish in the stream, but they carry it into the forest. The dead bodies of the salmon contain nitrogen, which is needed for the health of the forest. The salmon are unaware of what they're giving in death to the forest that supported them in life. The seagulls and the crow are also players in spreading the benefit brought back from the sea by the salmon. 
The decomposers, the carrion eaters, all of them have a role in this exquisite system of providing nutrients to the forest. It's called the nitrogen cycle. The question is this, do we support and perhaps enhance this environment or do we degrade and destroy it? Something to think about. We can jump in here or anywhere in the life cycle of salmon. That life cycle needs a boost sometimes from humans to mitigate changes we've made in the environment. And that's the role of a fish hatchery, like the one here, the Coal Rivers Hatchery at Lost Creek Lake. Salmon can't migrate past the Lost Creek Dam on the Rogue River, so fish are reared here to furnish the next generation of salmon. The hatchery consists of fish pens, lots of water pipes, and the control systems needed to provide the optimum conditions for salmon to grow and develop. At times, salmon, steelhead, and other fish are collected, stunned with an electrical shock, and sorted by species and by whether they're wild or hatchery fish. As English learners watch, hatchery workers go about this sorting, allowing the students to learn about these iconic Oregon fish and even to touch them. Students then get to witness other hatchery operations, like moving fish from one rearing pond to another to suit their growth needs. This is similar to the release process that will take place when the fish are mature. That's when they'll be trucked downstream and released into the river for the next step in their life cycle. The hatchery is where eggs are harvested from the females and fertilized with the milt of the male salmon. A much larger percentage of hatchery eggs will hatch out and survive than they would in nature. English learners on this field trip also watch the spawning of wild salmon in the Rogue River. Whether wild or hatchery, the basic life cycle for salmon is the same. We can start with the thousands of eggs laid by the female and fertilized by the male. Those eggs hatch to become alevins tiny fish with egg sacs attached to provide nutrition. When that stored food is used up, the fry leave the nest, the red, to forage on macroinvertebrates and grow. At this stage they have par marks, vertical stripes that help them blend in and become hard for predators to see. As they grow in size and strength, they migrate out toward the ocean and lose those par marks. Most will become food for other animals, but the survivors will follow the river to an estuary, an area that's a mix of fresh water and salt water. This is where they make a remarkable change. Their bodies reform themselves from a freshwater fish to a saltwater fish. They're called a smolt during this process. When smoltification is complete, the salmon are ready for the ocean, where they'll spend most of their lives, and many will become food for various marine mammals. Then they get an irresistible urge to return to the river and tributary where they were born. They stop eating, but they never stop trying to return to the stream where they hatched out. When they find their natal stream, they mate and lay eggs starting a new cycle of life from those eggs. They live long enough to protect the nest they made in the gravel. Then they end their own life cycle. They've given it all for the spawning. Their death brings new life, life that will renew the cycle as it has for countless years.